welcome to uh, Hillsborough Seventh-day Adventist Church, um, another uh, online edition. Um, we have um, a few more weeks. Um, we've decided to follow the uh, uh, guidelines of the conference and the local municipality uh, to when to op open up. So it'll be a few more weeks yet, um, indeterminate at this point, but uh, we will we will let you know uh, when the when we're going to actually open here. I, um, we, I hope that everyone is staying safe, uh, healthy, and uh, that the um, presence of God is, is uh, felt in your homes, uh, where, where you are this morning, that uh, the Spirit is here and the Spirit is, is where you are also. Um, I'd also uh, like to uh, encourage uh, each of you to uh, continue to give through the Adventist uh, Giving website. Um, that, uh, that we've, we will not have a video about it today, but uh, we've, we've shown that in the past, and I just want to encourage everyone to uh, continue to, to give at that website. Um, this morning, we will uh, we'll start our, our, our praise singing now. I invite the uh, praise team up. Um, going to focus songs on exalting Christ, uh, lifting him up as redeemer, and, and just giving glory to, to his name. We're going to start with He is Exalted, um, number seven in the book, but uh, He is Exalted by Twilight Parrot. Do you have an agenda? <laughs> I know I do. And I certainly like to complete my agenda on my time. But you know, God has an agenda and he has his time and he makes all things beautiful in his time. Yeah. 
Redeemer. It's Jesus, God's own Son. the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride Christ on the road to Calvary. 
Welcome each of you at your homes to uh, to kneel in prayer with, as we uh, as we pray here, and to uh, uh, lift us up as a congregation and uh, give uh, give glory to God in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, we we come before you this morning and uh, we praise you, Lord Jesus. You are the, the redeemer, the. Um, the, we, we sang of the power of the cross, the, 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 the victory that you won there. You, you, you know, S Satan tried to tempt you with, with you know, just kind of taking the easy way out and just getting this, you know, world you know, in the temptations he gave. But, but Lord, you had a, you knew the plan. You knew that, that, uh, you, and you knew your love. I mean, and, and we, we see that love in the, in the, 
the, the sacrifice that all of you gave to, for Christ on the, on the cross for us. We know that this was for us, but Lord, and, and so it's, it's no wonder, you know, when we get to heaven, we're going we're gonna to crest our crowns at your feet and, and give you glory and praise because we will see the, the, the vindication, the, the overcoming that is all because of you. And we just, we give you that, we give you glory right now for that. Lord, we, we uh, think of our situation here in our world now, and, you know, there's, there's some bad, there's bad going on. And we just pray that, that we, we all each, uh, each day, we make that connection with you, that relationship. And we know that, that you are, you are watching out for people. May we have your love in our hearts for others as we go through this time, that they can see the, uh, the, what Christ in our heart means and, what, what, and so that your um, kingdom can spread through, this, through this, uh, this bad time that's happening in our world right now. I just want to continue to lift up those who are on the front lines, those who are making decisions. Lord, this is, um, they're, they're putting it out. They're putting sacrifices out. And I just, uh, I just want to hold them up to you. And uh, I just want to also thank you for each one in this congregation. Can't, can't see them all right now. But uh, we'll get back together and uh, pray that, uh, that you're taking, we know you're taking care of them and they're staying healthy and that uh, in all things, Lord Jesus, Father, and Holy Spirit, you are glorified. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Little Agnieszka grew up in beautiful countryside in southern Poland. A big green forest stood on one side of her house. A green meadow with pretty white daisies and pink and purple wildflowers stretched out on the other side of the house. Agnieszka loved nature, but she was easily frightened. She didn't like the dark. Strangers were scary. Her family had cats, dogs, and chickens, but she was scared of them. She was especially terrified of mooing cows and gobbly gobbling turkeys. Fortunately, no cows or turkeys lived at her house. But a flock of turkeys did live in the yard of a farmhouse that she passed on the way to school. Agnieszka loved school and she loved walking to school. One morning, she skipped along the road to the village and turned the corner to school. A few steps later, she saw something that filled her with horror. She stopped in her tracks. Dozens of gobbly gobbling turkeys were wandering on the road. The birds were enormous and they made a loud, scary racket. <laughs> Agnieszka looked to one side of the road, a rushing stream. She couldn't walk through it. She looked to the other side. More gobbly gobbling turkeys were walking in a ditch and strolling in the adjacent meadow. She couldn't walk there. She looked beyond the meadow. The gate to the farmhouse fence was open and the yard was empty. The turkeys had escaped from there. Agnieszka was trapped. She couldn't go to school because of the gobbly gobbling turkeys. She couldn't go home because then she would be late for school. She sat down on the road to hide from the turkeys. God, help me, she prayed. Opening her eyes, she saw an elderly man riding a bicycle toward her. The man wore dark gray clothes and a dark gray cap. His bicycle was dark gray. He was coming from the direction of the school. Fearlessly entering the flock of gobbly gobbling turkeys, he energetically waved his arms and shouted, shoo, shoo. The turkeys gobbled even more and made a frantic dash toward their yard. Feathers flew and the screech of the gobbly gobbling turkeys was deafening. <laughs> Agnieszka was surprised that the stranger wasn't scared of the turkeys. She had never seen him before, but she wasn't afraid. He looked sort of familiar. As the old man rode past her, he said kindly, It's all right now. Agnieszka's mouth dropped open in amazement. 
She looked at the turkeys gobbly gobbling back in their yard. She looked back at the road to wave at the old man. He had disappeared. Agnieszka happily ran to school. She wasn't even late. The turkeys never invaded the road again. Agnieszka has always remembered God's answer to her frightened prayer. Now the mother of two children, she tells them how the stranger scared away the turkeys. I don't know whether he was an ordinary man or an angel, she says, but I know the victory came from God. I was able to survive the turkeys with God's help. Hope you enjoyed the mission story and the children's story combined in one thing this morning. Good morning, friends, and uh, thank you for uh, being here with us virtually. You know, some of you are obviously are live right now, and some will watch later on uh, at your own pace, at, at your own leisure. And whatever moment in your life you are watching this, I hope that God's blessing will be upon you. Now, today we have a, an interesting topic, I would call it. The title for my message is Cure for the Lukewarm Church. And I think many of you already know what I'm going to talk about, so you can turn off the TV or the laptop or uh, the phone, because you already know the message. Or maybe you should wait and see what I have to say. You know, this sermon has two parts. And one is really bad, and the other one is really good. And so I, I hope you'll be patient enough, enough to stick around to figure out which part is bad and which part is good. Before we go into the message, I would like to invite you to pray with me. Lord, we ask your presence here. We ask that you will speak to us. We ask that you will, you will inspire us through the Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts and give us the message that we need at this time. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The, the Bible for, for today, and I did not put it on the screen... So um, I invite you to grab your Bibles from wherever you have them in, in your home. Maybe it's on your phone and uh, maybe you're watching at the same time as you might be able to. Anyways, you'll find the Bible. If the Bible is on your phone, find the other Bible that has been dusted over there on the shelf and, and open it to Revelation. The book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible in chapter 3 Chapters 2 and 3 have uh, the messages to the seven, se seven churches. And the last of the seven churches is Laodicea. And I, will I, I would like to read here verses 14 through 22. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know <clears throat> that you are wretched, wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says 
of the churches. So, pull yourself together. If you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. Just believe in yourself. Well, remember to look out for number one. How about this? God helps those who help themselves. Did you hear this before? And by the way, did you know that this is the most quoted passage of Scripture that is actually not in the Scripture? God helps those who help themselves. Truth is, He helps those who cannot help themselves. Not those who can help themselves. And as we will see today, that is all of us. And he's helping all those people that cannot help themselves. But here we are talking about the, the God of self. The God of self. And it, it began in the Garden of Eden. You know, uh, Swindle stated it well when he says in one of his books, Insights on Revelation, Laodicea, the church that nauseates God. He says, while ancient pagans had hundreds of false gods to choose from, modern pagans have one false god that controls their lives, and that is self, self-expression, self-confidence, self-worth, self-reliance. These concepts all, around, all revolve around the myth that human beings have an, an inexhaustible source of strength within themselves. And such worthy people, of course, have trouble attributing all worth to God. Which is the very definition of worship. And I think this is an apt statement for Americans today. And not just Americans. But for our world, especially for those of us here in the West, I would say, we have an independent spirit, don't we? And Christ has a message for his self-reliant, independent-minded church. And the message is the one that we read in Revelation, you know, verses, chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And how many verses do we have here? Have you noticed? I'll make it simple. You know, however many verses we have here, that's however many concepts I will have in my sermon today. There's nine verses. So today I will have a nine-point sermon to address this message. And I have summarized um, each verse with a statement. And as we summarize this message, I want us to clearly understand where Jesus Christ stands concerning a church or a believer that is in such condition. So, you look in your Bible and you'll find the verse that is there, and I will not read the Bible again. I just put the statement there. Verse 14. The faithful and the true witness. He is the amen, says the scripture. The true, the truth indeed. You know, there is no falsehood in him. He is genuine, faithful, and true witness. What's that telling us? That's telling us that the one who speaks is an honest person. And he's telling the church in Laodicea exactly how they are. And I believe that we need to start with this concept. We will never find out the truth about ourselves, about our state of being, unless we get an honest opinion. If your friends, if you have something on your face and you're asking, Am I, do I have some, something on my face? And all your friends would tell you, oh, no, you're fine. How would that go? Um, first off, you would have something on your face and you would be embarrassed when you go out in public. Secondly, you will realize later on that actually you don't have really honest friends that didn't tell you how you were. 
So this is the first premise of this passage. The second premise, verse 15. You know, you look at the Bible verse here. Now, I know your deeds. I, I summarized it in, in this phrase. You are not what I want. And here we come to the, to the church of Laodicea. What is Laodicea? A few things here. The word Laodicea is a compound word. It's two words, laos, which is people, and dike, which means judgment. People that were reliant on the judgment of the people, people that were also judgmental. That's a possibility uh, to interpret how they were. People of the, uh, people of the judgment. Does that sound familiar? Uh, Seventh-day Adventists, I think we can relate to that. People of the judgment. So what is Laodicea? And here in verse 15, it says, I know your deeds. Uh, what's another word for deeds? Works. Works. Thank you. Uh, two people I have an audience. They confirmed it. Thank you. And I'm hoping that you online have confirmed it as well. Another word for deeds is works. And basically, Jesus comes and says, well, I know your works. Do you see any problem with this statement? I know your works. I know we have to have works. You know, I, we, we could talk extensively about what James says in his letter. You know, faith without works is a dead faith. So there is a place for works. But here Jesus comes and says, oh, well, I, I, I know what you're doing. And the reality is that you are not what I want. And Laodicea was not what God really wanted. So in a few points, historical points here. In 60 AD, and this is about 30 some years, 35 years or so before John writes uh, the, the book of Revelation by inspiration from God. In 60 AD, the city and the area sustained, a great, uh, sustained great damage because of an earthquake. Now, the self-sufficient city of Laodicea, unlike their neighboring cities, refused the imperial help coming from the Roman Empire, coming from Rome. Rome said, we'll help you rebuild. And Laodicea said, no, thank you. We're good. We don't need it because we have enough resources. And this was one of the wealthiest cities in the region. It was, excuse me, <coughs> it was a major banking center. You know, they had a thriving textile trade with coveted garments made with a special silky black wool. And the medical profession and the medicines made this city well known. Do you see the pattern here as, as you look at the other verses later on? And especially, uh, they were especially known for an eye salve that pro they produced that, that, that would treat various eye ailments. And this city was, with all its wealth, and it was wealthy, had a problem. They could fix a lot of things. They could rebuild the city. They could trade. They would have the garments. Uh, they would have all the gold. They would have the medicine for the eye. They had one thing that was missing. And that was water. If you go and visit Laodicea, you realize that it's pretty much dry. And they couldn't, there is no water source. And uh, there may have been some wells, but that's not enough to sustain a city, so they needed a water source, you know, and they had this water situation 10 miles to the east. You have the city of Colossae that had fresh, cold springs that were so refreshing, and just six miles to the north was Hierapolis, which is today known as Pamukkale in Turkey. And uh, Hierapolis had the, the healing hot mineral springs. Even today you would go there and they have some terraces. You may have seen those beautiful pictures with, with, with Pamukkale in, in Turkey. You have terraces, uh, basically swimming pools. 
that go from one, and, and the water seeps from one to another, and uh, because of the, of the minerals, uh, they, are all, well, they are all white. And it's a beautiful place to be at and to soak into the hot water coming out. But Laodicea didn't have the cold water of Colossae and didn't have the hot water of Hierapolis. So what did they do? They had to pipe in water. And they piped it in from Hierapolis. And by the time it reached Laodicea, it was a putrid, warm, mineral tasting water. That's what they had. And he would say, well, it's, it's really good. You know, we can use it for bathtubs. You know, it's warm, warm baths all the time. You don't have to take a cold shower. Well, that's good enough. But when, it have, when you have to drink it, that's a different story. So Christ stating that he wishes they were either hot or cold is not saying good or bad. It's not, you know, some people look at this verse and say, well, well, God wants us to be cold. Well, no, God doesn't want us to be cold. He says, I, I'd even have that versus you being in, in between. What, what God says here is that he rather wishes that we were useful. It's the usefulness of water. It's not the temperature of the water that he is focused on. Basically, God says, I, I wish you were doing what I want of you, but you are not. You are not what I want. And then we go to the next statement, verse 16. Well, it's as colorful as it can get. You make me want to vomit. That's what the original says. You continue to be, you know, if you look in verse 16, you make me vomit. Because you continue to be self-reliant, self-indulgent, self-confident. Just like the putrid, warm mineral water in the city, their actions and the self-worship made Christ want to vomit. Now, press pause. Oh no, don't press pause because it's a live stream, but... Mentally press pause. Press pause and think. What's that saying? Who were they worshiping? Well, let that picture sink in. You know, I think we should be sympathetic with the puker in this situation. Don't you think? Next. Verse 17 Basically, it says, stop trusting in yourself. It's pathetic. They were rich, wealthy, and without need. You know, they had no reason to trust God. They were doing fine. Why would we trust God? We're doing fine. Even if an earthquake hits, we can rebuild. Wretched, wretched pathetic, miserable. To be pitied. You know, Christ illustrates with what they are familiar with. To get his point across. Okay, you people in Laodicea. You may be self-reliant, self-sustaining. But there is one problem you have. And I will point you to that. That's how it is. This is how Christ views our, our worship of self. Stop trusting in yourself. It's pathetic. Now, look at what we see Christ, at how we see Christ, and what we discover about him in the next four verses. I told you there is a good part and a bad part of the sermon. And by now, I hope you figured it out that this was the really bad part of the sermon. And it brings me no pleasure to speak about it. But the one that is true and faithful, the witness, Jesus Christ, is addressing us. It's not me. But he comes up with a solution. Verse 18. What do we have in verse 18 here? It says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire. 
so that you may become rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. So you see, Christ addresses every single self-reliant characteristic of Laodicea. He says, oh, I have a, a better solution to that. But what we are really seeing here is grace and mercy. So what is grace? And what is mercy? You've, you've heard it before. So grace is getting what you don't deserve. And mercy is the reverse, not getting what you deserve. And what we see here in this verse is both of them offered freely, greatly by Jesus Christ. He is offering grace and mercy to this church. And of course, it, it uses these expressions. And I want you to keep them in mind as we go through these. It says, buy from me. What, what's that saying? Basically, Christ says, invest in me. Invest in Christ. And the question I would like to ask is, how valuable is he, Christ, to you? Well, if he's valuable, then invest it. If it's so worth it. And then the second expression is, clothe yourself. And we are made right with God at salvation. And yet there is, there is a sanctifying work that is ongoing. Being clothed in his righteousness until the day of perfection with him. That day of when we will be perfect with him. The, the third phrase, that you may see. That seeing what matters to God. You know, we might think that we are not blind and we see we need to see what really matters to God. Having his vision, having his sight. And Jesus Christ is offering them an opportunity. And here we come to verse 19. I love you. Please repent. Well, I, I know that we resonate so much with the first part of this phrase. I love you. We would like to hear that from Christ, don't we? Don't you? I love you. And I'm so happy that Jesus loves me. I'm so happy that God loves me. We kind of don't like the second part. And it's not because we're bad people. But it's something that we need. You know, discipline is coming their way. The word discipline has a bad connotation, right? You hear discipline, you hear punishment. But not, that's not what the word discipline is. Discipline means to make a disciple, to make a follower. We discipline our kids in the sense that we would like them to follow in our footsteps. So we disciple them. You know, Proverbs 3 verse 12 says, For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. That's the image of God that, that is depicted here. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. What comes first? I love you or repent? I mean, there is no doubt here. You cannot repent unless you understand that you are loved by God. And then if you understand that the depth of God's love, then, then you will be able to experience a true repentance which we need, don't we? I mean, if we don't need repentance, then what in the world are we doing here? And what in the world are we having still churches? Why have a Bible if we don't need repentance? That means we're good. Well, last time I checked, I'm not good. And I have a suspicion, well, almost like a certitude. I have a suspicion that you checked and you're not good either. Don't you think? So, and here we come to, to verse 20. Okay. This verse, and I will read it first. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with 
me. Now, this verse has been used many times out of context for purpose of evangelism. Let's see. Maybe you've seen this picture, right? Have you seen this picture? Yeah. Or maybe you've seen this one. Jesus standing at the door of your heart and knocking. Or maybe you even saw this picture. How about this one? Right? And that's Harry Anderson, the famous Adventist painter. And Jesus knocks at the door of UN, not because UN as an institution, but a symbol of the, of the world. Jesus appealing to the entire world. And this is a nice picture, but this is not the context of this verse. How about this picture? What do you see? You know, in searching for images for the sermon, I found tons of pictures with Jesus knocking on the door. I couldn't find one. There was one and I had to pay for it, so I didn't get it. One, one picture that would show Jesus knocking at the door of the church. There's, they're not available. But that's what this Bible verse says. I stand at the door. Which door? Whose door? Who is he talking to? What's the context? Here we get to the climax of the passage. End of the message. And the reality is, where is Jesus? Where is he? Well, Jesus is outside. In all those pictures that we've seen, where is Jesus? Outside. Outside of our hearts, outside of our families, and outside of the church. The main problem for Laodicea is not that it is lukewarm. The main problem of Laodicea is that Jesus is outside the door. Now think about it. And here we talk about symptoms versus causes. The fact that the church is lukewarm is not the cause. Is the symptom, is the effect. What causes that lukewarmness? Jesus is outside the door. We can get we get preoccupied with so many things that we forget that he is outside. We can even talk about him extensively. We do theological discussions about him while he's outside. And still knocks at the door. And here we come to the next verse. The verse talks about being an overcomer. And sitting with Jesus on the throne. Because he overcame and sat down with the Father on his throne. Jesus says, rule with me. Let me in. I want to dine with you. I want to have a relationship with you. Let me in, and together we'll, we, will, we will overcome. And how do we overcome? What do we need to overcome? And how do we have victory over the tendency to want to do it on our own? Because that is the biggest problem of Laodicea. Self-reliance. I mean, it's just four letters. Self. That's the biggest problem of Laodicea. And Jesus says, I have a solution. Well, I'm outside. Let me in. And together we will, we will overcome. Open that door. Allow yourself to have, to have a deeper relationship and a closer fellowship with him. Dine with him. Feast daily on the bread of his word. Get so close that you see the example he set before you and me. And he lived it for us, that example. And Jesus was offering 
this church, you call it Laodicea, you call it Hillsborough, you call it whatever you want. Jesus was offering this church of Laodicea to rule with him. I mean, you look at the other six churches and there's something good to say about them. A little bit here, a little bit there. Some of them are really good churches. Some of them are not so good, but at least one positive thing to, uh, is being said about all of the other six churches. There's nothing good that the angel has to say about the Laodicea. And yet, Jesus offers this church to rule with him. What kind of a business is this? Well, it's the business of grace and mercy. And the business of being with him and not on our own. And that is the biggest problem that we have. And that is the biggest solution that we have to that big problem. And it's a very simple one. So if Jesus offered the church of Laodicea to rule with him, there was hope. There is hope. You and I have an opportunity as a church, as people. We have that opportunity. God offers grace and mercy to his children. And then verse 22, we get to the end of this. And by the way, this is the last time that Jesus says this in the book. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And compare that to chapter 1, verse 3. It says, blessed or blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. There's a few things here. We have to read the words to the churches. And then we have to hear. We have heard, actually, the words he has for each of us. And what we need to do after you read and you hear, here in verse 3 of chapter 1, it says one more thing that we need to do. To heed what has been written? What does it mean to heed? To do it. Do it. Well, you read, you hear, well, do it. Here's where works come in place, but that's not the kind of works that I'm pointing at. The, the do it part of, of Laodicea, what was it? What was it that Laodicea had to do? Of course, there are three verbs there in verse, uh, I'm trying to remember, 18, 19, 18. Buy from me, you know, so you can clothe yourself. And then buy again, I salve, get I salve. And you might think that there's something that we do, but really what we need to do, the solution is offered in verse 20, and I'll come back to that. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. How do you buy from Christ? <laughs> and not on Amazon, I've heard you say that. How do you buy from Christ? How do you clothe yourself with a garment that comes from Him? And how do you get the eyes off? It's simple. Just open the door. He's at the door and he's ready to sell you all those. He's ready to give them to you as a gift. For those who do, for those who read, for those who hear the words, and for those that heed or do the words, God will bring a blessing to every single one of us. So here is the message this morning. On one side you have self. And all the failures that come with that. On the other side you have God. Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm standing at the door. And when you let me in, we're overcomers. I believe that we need to see more of him and less of me. 
people who take up the challenge. I would like to close with, uh, with a song, actually. Pray for me. I practiced a little bit, but uh, we'll see how it goes. And the song actually is entitled More of You and Less of, uh, Less of Me by Bob Coughlin. of me Oh my Father I want to be a spotless vessel so all can see more of you and less of me more of you and less of me Oh my Father I want to be a spotless vessel so all can see more of you and less of me What then I offer you when the very best I do is marked by the stain of my sin. My weakness only proves that though I might be used, your grace is the power within me. More of you and of me Oh my Father I want to be a spotless vessel so all can see more of you and less of me Though in my heart I've planned So all can see more of you and less of me. More of you and less of me. Oh, my father. spotless vessel so all can see more of you and less of me more of you and less of me and Lord Jesus we want to see more of you and less of us. Help us, Lord. Have a blessed Sabbath day. And until next week, God's blessings with you. Be an overcomer. He can do it.